actually out. Oh. Uh, really? Yeah, I need to brew some Five more. Oh. Uh, that one or a big old Americano. Oh, I thought you were joking. Oh, I was going along with the joke. <laughs> Uh, what's up, everyone? Uh, I'm here with uh, John Meredith. He is the owner of uh, Sweet Eats uh, Fruit Farm. And uh, today we're just going to get to know each other. Uh, so, uh, John, thank you so much for driving down south uh, here to um, Austin, South Austin. And it's good to meet you in person. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate you having me on your show. Yeah. I'm excited to get to know you and uh, just want to understand. So for those of you all who don't know, Jake just told me he quit his job to do this full time, which is a, a huge first step uh, for every entrepreneurial journey. Um, and I'm, I'm excited because I have questions for Jake because that's kind of what I could tell. Um, and, and so I wanted to uh, spend a minute to get to know him. Uh, and, and I've read through, so Jake, I've read through, or I've listened to your YouTube uh, podcasts and, and Jake and I had emailed back and forth uh, yesterday. So that way I could understand really what his vision was for the podcast, because ultimately I want to provide value for you. Yeah. And I want to provide value for, for the listeners as best I can. Um, so I guess the hardest thing for, from my perspective, when I tuned into your podcast was who is Jake? What's your background and what led you to this point of actually wanting to even start a podcast here in Austin? Yeah. So no, I appreciate you doing the due diligence and, and research. And we, we were definitely going back and forth in email, uh, trying to make sure we, uh, were on the same page before even, uh, doing this. Right. So, um, but I, I grew up in a small town, Erie, Pennsylvania, right outside of Erie called Union City, population 3000, graduated with 90 students. And it was a pretty small town out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the one thing that I was really passionate about was doing, um, we, we were the Union City Bears. That was our team, our high school, you know, and I, I was in charge with doing all of the media production and film. Uh, but I just never pursued that passion. But that passion, ever since I learned how to operate a camera, learn how to do post-production, uh, learn how to create uh, stories and film, it's always like stayed with me. Uh, so... Once I got to Austin and got like a steady job, had a steady income, that passion just kept coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I remember I got a job at Oracle in 2015 and, and this is after kind of climbing the corporate ladder, starting at Enterprise Rent-A-Car and uh, moving out here from California at the time. I didn't know anyone, um, but uh, you know, I started to, you know, get into this creative mindset and it came out in the, in the light of acting. And I ultimately moved to LA, um, in 2017 to pursue acting full time and, uh, didn't make it, uh, didn't survive LA. Yeah. Ultimately I wanted to move back here. And after that whole experience, it's just always been inside of, inside of me. Um, you know, regardless of like which job I took, it's just one of those like passions that just stuck with me. And I started out like doing like side hustle projects, like on Instagram, I did 90 days in Austin, which started to take off. But then I was like, okay, I got to like pull this back and, you know, go all into my corporate life, you know, cause like, so balancing out those two things was really challenging. But this year, um, you know, I went through a lot of like personal, uh, things and, um, it, it just kind of, kind of, kind of taught me that we, we have one life mm -hmm. and I was, you know, I'm 34 years old. And so I was, yep. was like, okay, well, why taken? Yeah, exactly. So yep. why not just, uh, go all in on the, on the passion? Sure. You got to understand the market and, and what the market is, is wanting yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think that that is um, on every entrepreneur's journey where, like we talked about in the email, where you end up versus where you start are, are two completely different trajectories. Um, and there's a lot that I've learned in life and in my previous jobs that are, are lessons learned that I think are super, super helpful for, uh, for every person that's wanting to kind of go down that journey and, and that route. Um, in your email to me, you had mentioned that, you know, you were really, I guess, can you, can you help clarify for me, uh, 
what your mission is here? Because I kind of got two separate ideas in your email that you sent to me, because one was, it seemed like you were trying to focus on newcomers to the Austin, Texas area and where they, um, perhaps we're having trouble getting connected yeah. uh, to the community. Um, and then the other aspect was really your passion for talking to people and, and showcasing the story or the why and the who behind a business. Yeah. So it seems like there's two different paths that you're trying to go down, but I'm not sure. Uh, can you just help, help me understand better? When I started to create content, I, I started to do video podcasts mm -hmm. and I love that element of, really stripping down the business and, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs have been on the show, um, so far and just understanding the story of where they came from. Um, but ultimately what I enjoy doing the most when I reflect back on moving to Austin, um, back in 2013 was, it was a, it was a big challenge for me to kind of get connected, you know, for the first two or three months It's very overwhelming, big city. And a lot of people are moving here without mm -hmm. knowing anyone. Right. I yeah. mean, you might just yep. see that somebody on uh, meta or Facebook or whatever X or whatever is uh, that you went to high school with us here, but it's really hard to get plugged into a community. Um, so my overall mission of this YouTube channel is to get, newcomers connected in the Austin, Texas community and kind of demystify, uh, you know, get, getting connected and, and, uh, bringing people together in, in groups and, and whatnot. So that's the overall mission. And I, I kind of came up with that by learning YouTube and learning that you need to kind of develop a niche. And when I got to Austin and started to get plugged in for me, that was like, that was, that just, it felt awesome. You know, it was exciting. It was, uh, I had momentum. I just felt like, uh, like things are moving very, very fast. And so what I'm trying to bring to the newcomer that just moves to Austin is a one-stop shop. Like you land on this YouTube page and you're able to see, okay, these are the things that I could do. Uh, here's the groups that I can get involved in. Um, here are some of the, the, the cool things that you're doing, like, you know, over at, at your farm. I, I've really, casted so many different nets in every direction. When I first got this camera, uh, I was really excited about learning everything with the camera and post-production um, and Adobe Premiere and, you know, learning that this, how to operate this lens and how to do the light. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to make a channel about how to create video content because you're probably, uh, you know, as an owner, you're probably familiar with, uh, content marketing and how video mm -hmm. is so important to driving, uh, customers to, to your business. Right. So I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to break down step-by-step step how to do that. But then I just kind of, you know, the whole, I brought up, I did, I did like a 90 days in Austin project yep. and I stopped doing that to, to really focus on uh, corporate B2B selling, but that, that still kind of stuck with me. Yeah. So you small town, Pennsylvania, then you went to UPenn, correct? Majored in psychology. Yeah. Correct? Uh, yeah. Penn state. Penn state. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with the universities in Pennsylvania. How big is Penn state? uh, as opposed to, Oh my gosh. Uh, large. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, so, uh, I want to say at least 80,000 students. Okay. Fact on check one, that on one campus or is it multiple campus, the campus system? Yeah. So I, so it's, it's a, a multiple branch campuses. I actually did two years at Penn state Barron, uh, okay. in Erie, and then I transferred down to Penn state, Maine. And that was, you know, going from Erie, Pennsylvania, Erie County, uh, to Penn state, Maine, that was a journey. I mean, that was like, Oh, this is, this is so different. Yeah. Um, I'm a small fish now, you know, yep. what made you want to major in psychology? Uh, being honest, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just had, I, I had enough credits in psychology and I saw a path, a clear path forward to, to me. The only thing that was crystal clear was get the hell out of union city and the, the, the best path forward in order to do that was to major in psychology. So I, I didn't, I wouldn't have to backtrack, but in the back of my mind, and I had said that I I've said this in an earlier podcast when I was doing like the barely news in high school and doing all the pre-production uh, and post-production and even being an anchor on the, the barely news. Um, like that's what I wanted to do. But I remember my teacher mentor at that time, 
told me not to do it because it's all about who you know. And so when you're 15, 14, 15 years old, you're very moldable, I sure. guess. You're, yeah. you know, you're going to take that and, and run with it. So I was just like, okay, well, the best path uh, to stay out of Union City and to kind of make it on my own to, to end up in a big city and live that life is psychology. So, and I th- also thought it was interesting to, to learn about people and, and how people work and whatnot. It is. People are fascinating. Uh, human behavior is, each person's behavior is unique, but yet at the same time, we're all kind of part of a collective. And so you, you start to stereotype and box people. And at least it's very easy to do the way our brains are wired. And so um, when I when I see, basically what I'm doing right now is I'm building a profile of who, who Jake is, right? Yeah. Jake, Jake is from a small town, went to university, did not want to go back to small town life, majored in psychology, and then transitioned into sales. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. What made you want to go into sales? I thoroughly enjoyed working with people uh, to solve their problems. No matter what industry it was, no matter what solution I was selling, it was all about meeting new people because that's, that's all I was doing when I moved away from home is meeting new people all the time. Yeah. Uh, moving from Union City uh, to the big Penn State campus, uh, the big st- state camp, or Penn State campus to Pittsburgh for six months, and then to Santa Barbara. I mean, it was just constantly, and then Santa Barbara to Austin, I was just constantly meeting new people, and I always enjoyed, like, learning uh, who they are, um, what makes them tick, and that's what selling is. Like, mm-hmm. if you're doing it the right way, yeah. It's, it's figuring out, Hey, do you have a gap? And if you do have a gap, do you see a path forward with what I'm, with what I'm selling? Sure. And like a lot of people that want, you know, want to be like a, a tech sales person. Um, cause that's kind of a big, uh, industry here in Austin, Texas. Um, mm-hmm. shout out to the Austin technology council and, uh, opportunity Austin bringing those, those big tech giants here. I don't know how you feel about that, but, um, it's definitely changed the Austin oh, yeah, absolutely. culture. Um, well, cha- change is inevitable in life. And, and so uh, I've always taken a mindset of embracing change uh, rather than trying to uh, be resistant to change. Being resistant to change is never um, a, never a good path forward in my opinion. Yeah. And we'll definitely put a pin in that because I know that um, your journey started with peaches and. Oh yeah. I mean, my journey is very actually similar to your journey. I grew up in a small town in Illinois and I wanted to get away as well. Uh, we can talk about that later. Let's, let's continue yeah. on with you. Yeah. Um, so, so sales and it sounded like you were doing really well with your sales. And so you want to help people. And so your goal of this podcast is to basically try to help people, newcomers to Austin. That's kind of where your, your passion meets, um, I don't say hobby, but your, your hobby and your passion converge to try to build something, a podcast, Mm -hmm. uh, that is, is unique, that is filling this market niche. Is that a correct assessment of what you're trying to do with the podcast or am I, am I mistaken in that? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say that's a, that's a very accurate assessment. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you just move, somebody just moved here from, I don't know, California. Mm-hmm. or maybe New York city, um, uh, mostly from California and you don't know anyone and you, you typically just go to different Instagram pages and maybe you're following some big influencers and, and foodies that are doing really cool stuff. And that's fine. Uh, but ultimately what I've seen on, on YouTube is there, there's no like one channel that says, Hey, like when you first get here, here's all the free things you could do. Uh, here's a guide of 10 things you can do when you first get here. Here's, here's what you should try. And, you know, converging that with video content and creating that, you know, mostly by myself, uh, from storyboarding early in the morning, uh, to shooting, to doing the post-production and having that all in one place for somebody to look at a playlist and, and say, okay, here's all the free things I could do. Uh, okay, great. Here's a subject matter expert in, in this area of Austin. So I ideally like, you know, today, you know, this is day two of, uh, being 
not on a W-2, uh, right? And it's crazy. Um, but I was just thinking about, okay, I need a schedule. Um, and my, my, I need to schedule this content so that way the YouTube algorithm pushes the content out to the right people. And so in order to do that, I need to develop a storyboard of which videos I'm going to film, how I'm going to film it, and what post-production is going to look like, right? Um, so, I, so I might start out with, um, and, and this is a plug for what's to come, for, like for everything that's free to do in Austin, maybe five free things to do in Austin, Zilker Park, Town Lake, Auditorium Shores, Barton Springs, uh, before 8 a.m., and you know, have some cool content and, and show people the details of like things you wouldn't really think about. Like, oh yeah, it's dog friendly. Uh, dogs are going to be off leash. Um, it's free before 8 a.m. Here's where you can park. Here's where you don't want to park. Um, you know, things like that. I'm going to, I'm going to lean into you just a little bit and it may get a little uncomfortable. I'm not trying yeah. to come across again, rude. Like I said in, in my email, what makes you think that the market is there, and I'm going to use the market as kind of a general abstract term. Mm -hmm. uh, the market is there for that to be your full-time job. A and I guess my other question is who else is in that space? Uh, I'm assuming you know all, you know of, if you don't know them personally, but you know of the influencers in Austin. Yeah. Just, just curious. So when I look at the numbers and, and did the research, mm -hmm. it's, uh, roughly 130 to 150 people are moving here every day. Correct. Uh, that's and, a, and that was, yeah, that's slightly old data. I don't know. That's now, old, but yeah. that's old data. Um, I, and, uh, you know, on top of that, there's people. So I, I would say you probably got to double that or triple that because there's also people considering moving to Austin, Texas. Sure. So, you know, double, triple that number. And, uh, then, you know, you'd ask about competition and, you know, when I did my research, which, you know, search engine optimization, mm -hmm. you're literally just using YouTube and typing in Austin, Texas to see what comes up. The number one thing that comes up is things to do in Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, and so when you, when you go down that rabbit hole, then you start to see the other videos that are out there mm -hmm. on Austin, Texas. And most of what you see are videos with still images, uh, that, do a, do a, a decent job at kind of telling the story about some of the landmark places in Austin. Um, but you know, I, I want to kind of, kind of take that and run with it a little bit more and maybe have a schedule where I'm like, well, you can go to, uh, you know, uh, sweet eats and it's like a playground. It's like an amusement park. If you have kids or if you have friends that are your age and you're in your twenties, you, you could do all that right? At your business. And in addition to that, what I also want to bring to my channel is the owner of sure. And, yeah. and so that's kind of the, what I'm looking to push. Uh, no pun intended. Um, that is my last name. So that's mm -hmm. how the, the thing came out. But, um, so here's the thing. And, and then I want to have a guest come on and do a video podcast, you know, where it's quality video production to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to do a whole uh, segment, a whole film on uh, Sweet Eats Fruit Farm. And then I'm going to have the owner come on and talk about it. So you really know where it came from, um, what to do when you get there and, and things like that. I, that format I have not seen. Sure. Um, um, and, yeah. and, and to be completely honest, I, I started, but before I started the journey and I deal in, or, or you, and identifying my competitors and identifying the market for the content that I'm, uh, that I'm creating, um, or, you know, day two, whatever. Um, I took a course, uh, back in July. I, I just started learning post-production Adobe premiere. So I started, like learning, um, how to do all the stuff that most people are outsourcing. Cause I want to do all that in house. Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like you lose a little bit of your story and you lose a little bit of the, the things that, that make you kind of who you are. Authenticity. Authenticity. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. You lose that if you're outsourcing. I agree. And you like, you have a lot of, and I'm not like blasting all the influencers that are, that are out there, but you have a lot of people that are just outsourcing and pushing their content to somebody else to edit for 75 bucks a pop. And I'm just like, no, nah, I'm going to learn that first. Sure. And then second, I am going to get a DSLR camera 
And then I'm going to learn exactly how to film that. And then third, I'm going to learn my niche and the market that I'm going after. So I think it should have been the other way around. <laughs> like, I, I think I should have spent more research. Um, but I, I feel like I'm at a point where, uh, you know, it's the Austin newcomer. Uh, there's enough people that are moving here. There's enough people that are visiting here. There's enough people that uh, are, are researching, um, uh, you know, Austin, Texas and, and things to do in Austin, Texas. And we have South by Southwest. We have um, Austin City Limits where people are just constantly coming here. Sure, there's a lot of tourism. Yeah. Does Google provide, um, like I know with AdWords, for example, they'll tell you some trending searches. They tell you how popular certain keywords are. Does that exist for YouTube because it's inside of Google's ecosystem? Can you see how many people on any given day are searching Austin, Texas? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you could you could break that down. Um, I'm actually uh, learning some of that. There's tools out there. Uh, one is called VidIQ. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good good tool you can use to explore uh, YouTube. Uh, or you can use YouTube Studio, uh, which is built a module built within YouTube uh, to learn who's watching your content, um, how many people, like what's the hottest topic? Like vidIQ will literally, if you have an idea in your head, you punch in that idea and it'll give you a list of like five topics that are really trendy right now. Okay. Um, so... And I think a lot of people are also using other tools out there. Feel free to drop a comment, uh, you know, below. If you are using other tools, we'd, we'd like to know about them. Um, but in, in doing your research, which is so important, like mm -hmm. for like going to market and um, building your marketing strategy, if, you, if you're not doing your re One thing I've learned is uh, like, like the exchange that we had uh, yesterday. It's like, hey man, I got to your YouTube channel and I would have never guessed that you are targeting the newcomer. Yeah. Because my content's at all over the place. It is, yep. And I'm like, fair statement. Um, I, I know we're going to meet and talk tomorrow, but uh, here's a little a little bit of my backstory. Sure. Um, but it's so, it, it's so important. And, uh, you know, I think for anyone that's like looking to start a business, if you're not doing your research and if you're not learning video content and how to leverage it and search engine optimization, you're kind of out, like, or you will be. I think Nike has the best marketing slogan of all time. Yeah, the just do it. Yeah, with your just post it. Just, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I kind of mimic that because it, it, it's like when you're doing and creating content, like, you're consuming, but if you don't take action on that. Sure. And just throw yourself out there and just hit the record button, then you're not going to learn. I mean, there's two ways to learn. Like, you consume knowledge but then you have to apply it mm -hmm. and just go out there and do it. So I think Nike's slogan is like the best of all time. Maybe a, a slightly different aspect to think about when it comes to uh, how, so I, number one, I agree with you uh, that you can learn by uh, doing and making the mistakes. Uh, and I think that that is very important. I've made a tremendous amount of mistakes in my life. Um, I think one, one lesson learned in life though is uh, humans have an amazing ability to mimic, um, mimic things, mimic each other. Um, and, and like, if you look at, and I know you don't have kids, but if you look at how a kid learns to talk, they're mimicking their parents uh, and, and the sounds that they're, they're hearing from their parents and they're trying to say those words and they see their parents walking, right? And so they're pulling themselves up and they're motivated to go get that toy in the co corner or whatever when a kid starts to take their first steps. Um, children are, are, are great examples of that. And so one thing that I, I would propose to you is, is a question of, hey, if this is your entrepreneurial journey that you want to do and you want to be a, a podcaster and you feel like there's this niche to fill, there's a question of, and, and your first, uh, your first guest uh, on episode one did a really good job of talking about this from a personal development standpoint of, Hey, I can look out and see all of these good characters of this characteristics of this person and this person and this person. Why can't I be that man today? I think there's a same question of that in a business world of, hey, I see this really good influencer and they're doing this really well. And this other person is doing this really well. And how can I, how can I mimic what these other really successful people are doing? 
um, and, and internalize that and take my own unique spin on that and then push that out and see how the market responds, so to speak, as opposed to most entrepreneurs start with this idea and then they try to impose it on the market. And it's a different mindset when you go down that road. Um, and, and the challenging thing is if the market doesn't respond and say, yes, we want that, uh, then you as an entrepreneur are backing yourself into a corner, especially if your pride is very high and you can't pivot and adjust along the way to and listen to what the market is telling you, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. And that's... As we get into my story, we can talk. We can talk more about that. Uh, but that's one, I guess, encouragement that I would give you is, hey, as you go down this journey, what are people doing really, really well in this space, and how can I, how can I mimic that? And I think just shooting from the hip here, uh, if if I was in your shoes, one question mark I would have is, is this market big enough for me as a full time content creator? Right. I don't know the answer to that. I know nothing about YouTube and the algorithms. What I can tell you about big tech and the algorithms is when they change, you're in trouble. If you if you have uh, if you have things figured out, um, like we have on our Facebook page, we have a hundred thousand followers on our Facebook page, and Meta is constantly tweaking their algorithm uh, and. and over the years, we've seen the engagement rise. We've seen the engagement fall. Uh, it is Jake is my marketing guy as well, and it drives him nuts because it's always changing. And you're, to a certain extent, at the whim of uh, big tech and the algorithms that they set out. And so it could be somebody in a desk saying, oh, let's push this other content. And now your channel is getting a lot less views, right? And, and so that as an entrepreneur and as a business owner, when you take, when you don't have the control of your viewership like that, that is of concern uh, because your, your business at the, is at the whim of YouTube right now, effectively, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so that's another encouragement I would give you is just to be thinking about how, if you look at all of the podcasts and, and, and I don't know, uh, I know the podcast industry is huge. I don't know, uh, the industry best practices, but that's something that I would be looking at if I were you and not putting all of my eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and there's a lot of other platforms, obviously that people are, are using like meta, good example. Um, TikTok, not sure that that I should well, mention. They'll be around, yeah. Yeah, not we'll see sure what happens with the ban. Yeah, we, we don't know what's going to happen with that, but that's a good point. I think uh, a lot of people say you got to be audible ready. Uh, you got to be um, able to pivot, um, and I, I think that uh, the other day I, I'm actually finishing up a um, and a podcast uh, post production that should be out uh, by this weekend, uh, and. Um, oh, let's get a preview. Who is that? Uh, Peter, Peter Duffy, he's, uh, the founder of dealer image pro and the CEO of dealer image pro. Uh, and they do, uh, merchandising software for the automotive industry. And, uh, they're, uh, really the, the industry standard, uh, for having your, your cars photographed in, in the most consistent and quality, uh, way possible. And, uh, what I learned from him during that conversation, uh, is that, you know, life and, and your career, is really just acquiring a set of skills. Mm -hmm. And as you're climbing that mountain, you might, you know, if you need to take a step back, there's, there's no, there's no going back down the mountain cause you're already up, you know, like, so, so you might need to like come down a little bit, uh, and, and find just like another path up that mountain, uh, and, and use your different skill sets, uh, in order to do that, you know? So I think that that was a kind of a good metaphor. I'm probably butchering it, but it, it'll be in the podcast that's coming soon. My passion lies in the journey from point A to point B. I don't care what that is. I want to take a business from point A to point B. I want to take a person from point A to point B. What it is doesn't really matter. It's the journey of life as you get older that you will realize is really uh, what's important. Uh, where, where I thought we could start with you, John, is just to learn a little bit about who you are and the best, the best way I know how to do that in talking to somebody is asking where you're from, where you grew up and what that was like. Yeah. So I, I'm just an ordinary dude, 
just trying to do what he was wired to do, do what I was made to do. I think, I think everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. Your strengths and weaknesses look different than mine. Uh, and so, uh, I'm, I'm just a guy trying to, <laughs> trying to survive in this world. Uh, but I, I grew up in Illinois, a small town car- called Carbondale, uh, the Southern Illinois. It's, uh, it was about 20,000 people plus a university there. And much like you, I wanted to leave the area. I didn't see uh, a lot of economic opportunity. And so in, in high school, I applied to a bunch of different colleges and uh, actually University of Texas was the only one I got into. Um, and so my parents weren't super happy about me being so far away, but they knew uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity in, in my town. Um, and so I came down here for school and I've been down here ever since. Um, uh, so I went to the University of Texas, as I said, and I attended 2001 to 2005. I majored in government. Um, I did that because most, uh, kind of like you, I had, a, I had a really good government professor. I found it very interesting. Uh, and, and so it was an easy way for me to uh, go through college because I, the classes were interesting. And um, unfortunately, by the time I had started doing internships and understanding, I'd worked at the Capitol, uh, there was a lot of red tape and bureaucracy uh, that I was not a fan of. Uh, it was very hard to get things done. You know, much like in life, it's not what you know, it's who you know, and that exists very much in politics. So that rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, and I had a buddy who uh, had started, uh, I was one of my neighbors in the uh, college. He had started at a company doing equity trading here in Austin, where the company uh, would front you the money and they get a percentage on your what revenue you generate for them. Uh, and for them at the time, it was just a numbers game. And so um, that's where I went kind of after college. Um, and I got into the to the stock market world. Um, and there's did that for 10 years. There's a tremendous amount of lessons learned in that, kind of what I've alluded to earlier uh, with um, – business and life in general. Uh, when I started trading, you know, you, you kind of, kind of like you in this journey of wide eye, you don't know which way to look, which way's up, which way's down, where should I focus my eyes? Uh, and, and, and what should I be doing with my days? How should I best spend this? And um, like I had said with the, the mimicry aspect, what, what I did was I learned from the best people in my firm, Mm -hmm. we learned what they were doing. And then the goal was effectively to do it better than them. Did did you, how did you learn from them? Like, would you put time on their calendar? Did you reach out? Did you ask for time? Uh, yeah. So there's, there's several different aspects to, to learning. One is learning the psychology, uh, behind things. One's the, the mechanical aspect of actually trading. Uh, but the other, and this was more valuable was me sitting down myself and, and one of my buddies at the time who started at the same time I did, uh, we went around and interviewed, uh, they call them high performing traders. And he and I kind of like you did on a podcast, this was 2005. And so it wasn't, uh, with the nice video setup. We, we had, a, a iPhones weren't even out then which is hard to believe. I believe iPhones came out in 2006 or 2007. Yeah. Uh, was the first gen. Cause yeah. I remember looking, I was like, wow, this is everything a phone should be. It's kind of like a Tesla today. This is everything a car should be today. It's everything a phone should be. So I don't even, I think we used an MP3 player to record it. Like that's how old the technology was. Um, and we just sat down and we talked to these guys and we picked their brain. So that way we could understand how they thought about things and effectively some of the nuggets of wisdom that they had imprinted upon us. Um, and, and one of them, and I've shared this with my management team at the farm, is if you do the right things, the money comes in the trading world. But that's in general in life. You do the right things in video podcasting and the success will follow. The question is, what are those right things? And that's really where I was talking to you about with, hey, 
what are the things that the other podcasters are doing? What are the successful pieces that you want to take? And you want to create something super unique here that resonates with the market in general, where you've got people who want to consume your content. So, so you seem rather very curious and inquisitive about, about things like the story you just told about you and your friend, uh, kind of interviewing these high, high performing, uh, traders. Mm -hmm. Like I think questioning is a, is a skill that not enough people talk about on like Mm. these shows when it comes to business or anything questioning is like how you learn. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'd like to better understand how you and your friend would come up with these questions. Would you just bounce ideas off each other? Oh man. Or like, would you write? Like, Cause like, like me personally, I have questions like when I'm learning this like new stuff or anything else in my past career, I would oftentimes just pull out uh, my iPhone and just, Hey Siri, remind me about this. Yep. And that's how I would do it. Um, in all honesty, I don't remember uh, how we did it back in the day. We did sit down and talk about it. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a long time ago. It, if I was in your shoes right now, I would be consuming uh, a bunch of podcasts and analyzing the, the questions and the train of thought that they have um, and, and understanding the flow of the conversation and then backing up and being like, okay, how did that person think of that? Because there is a skill, I think, uh, for a good interview interviewer it is to follow that conversation, but really at the same time, try to read between the lines and then ask a deeper, more probing question, especially if you know your audience and you know what is valuable to them out there in the, the digital world. Um, if you can start to, as you interview people, pick apart and isolate a few select nuggets of wisdom, there's a famous quote, and I, I don't remember what it is. <laughs> So it's not that famous, uh, but, uh, you know, it was about, it was about asking the right questions. Like that's, that is so true in life. you like, you don't, it's not that we don't know the solutions. It's that we don't know the proper questions, something along those lines. And that's, that's the things in general. Uh, and yes, I try to be a walking sponge basically everywhere I go. You know, I, I was thinking about it as an analogy the other day when I, my kids notice, like when I walk into a building, because I've been doing a lot of construction, I'm looking around. I'm just observing and just filtering. How did, how did they build this? Why did they do this versus this? Oh, hey, maybe this isn't up to code, but because the building is old, just as I'm doing construction, which has no relation at all to really my actual business, although there's, there's some aspects with that. And I think, um, so the farm currently doesn't do haunted stuff at all. Uh, eventually we'll probably get into the haunted space. That's one of the things that uh, my employees love to do. And it's a very natural pivot and fit for the farm. Um, but I was at the haunt show in St. Louis a couple of months ago and I was in a classroom with this, this guy. I know nobody in the haunted industry. I know nothing about the haunted industry. This guy who runs this very successful haunt in Dallas, uh, what he had said uh, to one of the, there was a question like, Hey, how do you know all this stuff? And he was like, you know, I, I'm just inquisitive. I like to learn and learning lifelong learning is a huge skill, uh, that will benefit anybody who is open to not just coasting through life. Uh, but he said he was going to go, he was excited about going to a, um, Oh, a tape, uh, adhesive. It was an adhesive conference. Hmm. Like in Vegas, I don't, I don't know where the the conference was. Are you familiar with a, an adhesive conference? No, I, I I am smiling and laughing because it just seems like there's like a a conference for everything. Yeah, there is a conference for everything, which <laughs> blows my mind. But why is a haunted guy interested in adhesives, right? But but, but there's something that he's going to go there, and he is going to act like a sponge and absorb and get this idea, and then he's going to bring it back and put it into his business. Uh, he is a, he is a walking sponge as well of, of just trying to absorb information and understand and process and file it away. Hey, when can I use this? What's the best practice? How do I do this? How do I do that? Um, and it, it's a, it's a little bit different of a mindset, but it's that constant learning mindset that I think is is crucial 
when you're owning your own business. So, so the financial uh, industry and sector, it wasn't really in Austin. Um, like to your point, like it was in New York predominantly. Mm-hmm. So like, what was the community like, like in, like in the, the financial industry? Like, like what was the community like in Austin? Uh, so I can't speak to um, the traditional financial community. And by that, I mean your, your certified financial planners, uh, your, your funds, uh, your private equity. Um, I knew a little bit of, of that side of the industry, but, uh, or yeah, there's a big mutual fund. Sometimes if the traders, um, so one of the, one of the challenging things about the trading industry is the skill set that it provides does not translate much into the real world. Right. And so, uh, let's say you're uh, a young college grad and you're getting into the trading world and you're trying to figure things out and you spend two years doing that and you're still not able to make it go. Your skills are not necessarily transferable to other industries or, or even inside of the financial industry, if that makes sense. Uh, we did see some people move on to insurance sales. We saw people would move on to some of the bigger brokerages doing risk analysis, things like that. Uh, but it, it definitely was uh, even, even so inside the financial community, the trading community here in Austin was definitely uh, much more insulated. And I would say it was a fairly tight knit community, yeah. especially as we went through the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, I mean, there was, there's a lot of camaraderie that's going on at that time. Uh, I don't want to say it felt like Band of Brothers because you can't at all compare war to what we were doing. Um, but it, there was the camaraderie that you'd feel much like you were if you were in college and you were in the dorm rooms and sharing. You know, you're all going through this life experience together. <laughs> and I think to your point about the channel – one of the, the hard things about the newcomers who moved to Austin, and this isn't Austin specific, this is anywhere, is when you move somewhere and you don't have that community, it's really hard. It's really hard to get connected uh, because people, I don't want to say don't care, but people have their own things going on. Um, and, and that makes it even more challenging uh, so when you're in college, it's very, very easy because you're in all of, you're in the same life stage with those people. Right. Uh, and so you're you're doing everything in life in general together. And then when you get out of college, and perhaps you experience this, uh, young college post grads in their their mid twenties, you're still kind of in that same life stage. So if you move to a city and you're super extroverted, it makes it a little bit easier to connect with your peers. But as you get older and you get into your thirties, and people start getting married, they start settling down, they start having kids, their focus from the outside now becomes the inside. Mm -hmm. And then when that's the case and you take a family and you move across the country and you know nobody in a city, it makes it even that much more difficult to get plugged in unless you're a super social butterfly. Right. Um, Which some people are and and they can connect and, and make friends wherever they go, but that's not necessarily, that's not at least half of the U.S., yeah, that, that's an interesting observation about college and, and being in that journey with the people in the, in the dorm. You're all going through the same journey. You're going mm-hmm. through school together. I got lucky when I transferred from Santa Barbara, California to Austin because I was at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Yep. And there were a lot of people moving here in 2013 uh, with Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Uh, so we were, and it was a, that's a painful journey uh, to go through their, their um, management trainee program and to have transferred uh, to, to Austin and not really know anyone. So we had that connection and we were going through that painful journey together. And so that's, it took me about two, three months to feel a little bit at home, but it's still, it, it was a little bit easier because I did have that community at, at work. And I think that also is relatable to going through college because it's, you're going through like a journey with those people. Yeah, But if you're like, to your point, like starting from complete scratch, especially in this remote world, that could yep. be pretty challenging. It's very isolating. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think that that is uh, at a previous point in our culture that that would be really what churches would be super helpful for is, is you would get plugged into the local church uh, and you would meet people. And we're involved in, in a church in Georgetown, but I know 
uh, obviously church attendance overall has declined. And so it's kind of a question. And, and I think there's articles out there, they call it, you know, the third space. You've got your work, your home, and then where else do you go to actually build community? In our society, with the internet, uh, where you don't necessarily need that personal interaction, but yet there's a deep longing for it still. Yeah, so like going from, uh, you know, the the community, I had asked you about the the financial community here in Austin, and I was very curious about what that looked like. So how, how did you go from the financial world uh, to the farm world. Like, yeah. That's most people are very curious about that uh, because it is so different. Um, there's, there's a few things uh, that kind of uh, aligned with that. So much like you, I, you know, I have a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug. I didn't mention it earlier, but my dad owned his own business. Uh, my mom was a school teacher and she worked her way up to principal to assistant superintendent to superintendent of the district uh, she was very big on education. And so I I had seen, you know, that was kind of the household that I grew up in, in the sense of my dad owning his own business. And it was a small business, you know, a couple of employees. It wasn't, wasn't big by any means. But that plus this educational side of it, having those influences on me. And, and um, I guess I'll, I'll sidebar a little bit of a conversation here. Uh I don't know if you're familiar with um, hypomania. Uh, there is a book called The Hypomanic Edge. And one thing, and part of why I'm talking about this is because I don't know, again, are we going down the direction of newcomer? Are we going down the direction of entrepreneurial aspect to, to, to Austin? Um, but there's a really interesting thesis out there. Uh, I don't remember who the author is. Uh, but the idea is effectively that because America is a land of immigrants, um, people are naturally, people who are here in their genes, they've got this aspect of mania, hypomania is what he would call it and define it as, um, of basically unbridled optimism, if you will, to, to summarize it. There's, there's more to it than that because you're believing that my future is better over there and I am willing to sacrifice to get to that better vision mm -hmm. that exists in the future. Uh, and I'm willing to go through physical threats and danger to make that vision a reality because it is way better than what I'm doing here. And so when you have a land of immigrants and you have those people that are willing to cross the sea or go through dangerous cartel territory, I'm not going down a political path, but uh, what happens is you get this land of these people who have this idea in their head and um, there is a certain amount of entrepreneurial spirit that exists in America and you see it in some of the other nations where there's immigrants, which is Canada and New Zealand. Um, there is something in our DNA that makes us have this kind of unbridled optimism uh, for the entrepreneurial community versus if you look at Japan, for example, the amount of people who viewed starting your own business in Japan as a favorable decision, 8%. 8% in Japan. You don't wow. rock the boat in Japan. You don't, yeah. you don't, you don't try to do anything new or different uh, versus America starting your own business. It's like 82% optim optimism or 82% uh, viewed favorably. That person is trying something. So even if you don't, aren't the one to do it, the community is rooting for you to do it. And there's just a completely different culture. There's a whole organization, actually entrepreneurs organization, uh, EO, I believe is the name of it, for people who start and run, I think you've got to do at least $2 million a year in revenue. I'm not sure if they've updated it with inflation and all of that. Uh, but it's it's basically a whole community to support uh, those, those types of individuals. Um, and it is, I agree with you, in a smaller uh, blue-collar town, it is much harder uh, to... You don't rock the boat in a smaller blue collar town. No. Right? My my wife's from <laughs> Nacogdoches, which great small small town, but uh, the the people in Nacogdoches aren't um, necessarily going to be receptive of new ideas, much like they would be in Austin. 
Where where is that? Uh, it's northeast Texas. Northeast. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's north of Houston, east of Dallas, two hours each way or so. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, and I I can I can kind of speak to that feeling. Uh, you know, when I had moved away uh, from Union City and then coming back for the holidays and yeah. meeting with your friends at the bar. Yeah. Your high school friends and they're just stuck. They're stuck in that environment. But yeah, and, and they're just not really open to what you're doing or yep. what's new with you. No, I don't really care. Yep. So it's kind of the the, the the vibe I got. Yeah. It's very, very unique and, and interesting there. Most of my friends, most of my friends from uh, my town moved away. Um, yeah, because they, there was no opportunity uh, there for them to, to have personal growth and development because you, you're just really generally stuck in that mindset in that life. And, if my parents ever watched this, you know, they, they would probably frown upon that because that's where they live still. But I think that they, they would acknowledge that it's okay. They're not on YouTube. Uh, are, <laughs> are you, uh, yeah. I, I feel like, um, like a, a lot of parents are mostly on Facebook. Yeah. A lot, a lot of them are on Facebook. Yeah, like all the old people are on Facebook these days. Yeah. yeah. Like, like commenting on random stuff, but I don't want to go down that path, but, um, it's, it's happening. Um, yeah. but, uh, no, a, a question I had is, um, are, are you still in touch with a lot of people from where you grew up, like where you're from? Uh, at this point, no. But I was never uh, a, a super social person. There's a handful that I still keep in contact with, but it's not much. Yeah. Uh, and we go back to visit my parents. My brother took over the family business, so he's back in that community. Uh, but, yeah, in general, we don't go back, and I don't have a whole lot of communication uh, with, with that, with the, with the people from high school. Got it. Is, it. is there a reason do you think for that? I think it's just time. Uh, you know, uh, I'm slightly older than you six years. And so I think that as you progress through life and you go through different life stages and, and you're experiencing this right now, there are certain things that you're like that, that almost feels like a former life because it was so far back it's like, I don't even remember that. Like before I owned the farm, what was my life like as a trader? Yeah, I've got these memories of what that was like, but that is now so far removed from me that it feels very foreign uh, and a completely foreign concept. And yeah, continuing down that train of thought, there's a, a lesson learned in trading of, do you want to make money or do you want to be right? <laughs> And those are those are two separate ideas because in, in the trading world, you battle two emotions. You battle fear and you battle greed every day. Am I fearful? Am I greedy? And what you find in the market is sometimes, and this happens to everybody, including myself, you get married to an idea. You become romanticized about, hey, the story behind this. And so, therefore, I believe I am right. I believe the market is wrong. And then it goes down. It goes, or maybe that moves against you. Maybe you're shorting it. Um, but the, the position moves against you, and you, you can't swallow your pride. You can't say, I was wrong. And so, what do you do? Either you hold on or you buy more. And then what happens? Well, it could go back up, and then you have positive reinforcement of a negative behavior. Or it can keep going down, and then you buy more. And I've seen, I've seen, and I've had massive losses, and I've seen this where guys blow out their entire account because they can't swallow that pride. Um, and, and so, to bringing it back to, to the circle about uh, the idea of YouTube and the titles and clickbait or not, one of the things that we were struggling with, like I previously talked about, was our, our engagement on Facebook because we saw our engagement tick down, down, down because they had changed the algorithm. They weren't promoting business pages anymore. Uh, and if you hadn't inter in a, interacted with our page in 30 days, then you weren't going to see us. Even though I had 100,000 people, it didn't matter. Uh, who, who was, how was that discovered uh, at your business? Uh, so we do KPIs every week. Uh, we're not necessarily monitoring engagement. We have done that, but engagement is so seasonal for us that it, it's not necessarily fully reflective. Um, and so it was Jake, the the marketing guy. He was the one, because I don't pay a whole lot of attention to our social media. 
um, he was the one who was like, hey, we're not getting in, any engagement. And, and, and this goes kind of also in the face of conventional wisdom because for a long time, the, the conventional wisdom, hey, if you want to be marketing, make three posts a day, make whatever post a day, do these certain things, follow this recipe. That's not how it works. And I think when you, so again, going back to mimicry, who is doing social media right? Who is doing social media well? What, are, what is their engagement and what are they doing? And so you'll actually go back and you'll see a market change in our Facebook page. You're going to see a lot more memes on our Facebook page because everybody loves memes. They're hilarious. It's so true. And I'm not necessarily, so you'll see memes scattered with informational posts because we need to be able to provide customers with updates on peaches or strawberries or whatever else, or what we have going on. But at the same time, we exist as a company for, to entertain people. We want them to have fun. We want to give them this experience. And, and in, that, in that breath is how do we entertain people with whatever we do, including our social media posts. So we started doing memes. They actually got a lot more traction than our normal posts because people want to laugh. And while it may not be great engagement, it is significantly better engagement than what we had previously. Kind of taking a step towards your your business now, uh, mm-hmm. Sweet Eats Fruit Farm. Oh yeah, your question, your original question so, of how I got started. So with it. no, I, this is this is why long form is great because we can go and whatever we we could pull each other back if we need to. We could go in every direction. But like you had asked me about a mountain I'm climbing. Yeah. So when you embarked on this this farm, mm-hmm. it originally my my understanding is that it started with peaches. Correct. And so how did it go from choosing your own peach to a full-blown farm amusement park? So, so let's back up a little bit and let's talk about the idea to begin with. Okay. So I'd been trading, 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 and, um, you know, working at a computer all day, uh, sitting at a desk all day, it, it's not good for human health. Uh, we are not designed to be sitting at a computer all day. And so, uh, in an effort to be healthy, I would buy, I would go to HEB and buy a bunch of fruit for the week. And that would be what I would snack on. Cause we would get from the trading floors perspective at that time, uh, they had catered meals every day. They did not want you to leave because if you left, that means you're missing something. They wanted you at your desk. And it was an unwritten rule because you were, uh, paid by commission only. So if you didn't make money, then you didn't get paid. It was really up to you and you could take whatever breaks you wanted, but Catering was a way for them to make sure you didn't leave the office during the lunchtime. And so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to HEB every week, uh, buying fruit. And again, just absorbing. And I see the price of blueberries start fluctuating pretty dramatically throughout the year as, as I'm doing this. And, um, blueberry, all fruit, uh, wholesale is public available data, uh, as far as the pricing. And you can get all this historical data. And me being a, a nerd, I went through and started looking and graphed out the blueberry price fluctuations in the market. And uh, twice a year, price really spikes on blueberries. And then twice a year, the price really craters. Uh, mm-hmm. And what that is, is where it spikes is you've got South America and North American production. And those gaps between one coming online and the other one going offline, you have a supply demand imbalance causing the the price of the blueberries to spike. And so me being uh, a tinkerer, uh, what I did was I built built a walk-in cooler in my garage and I uh, started trying to, uh, blueberries need a certain number of chill hours. Let me kind of back up again, uh, where they, in order to set fruit, uh, several different types of plants are like that. Peaches are the same way. You've got to have a certain number of chill hours on every given year to have them flower. Uh, if we had a really mild winter, I would not have my peaches flower and I wouldn't have any fruit because the fruit comes from the flower. So I had tried to chill the blueberries during the summer. That way I could get a fruit set in the fall or fruit uh, for that fall spike. And I'm just testing, you know, it's like 50 plants. It's nothing. I'm just screwing around. Well, it was a huge failure. Didn't work at all. Didn't work. There's way better ways to do it. There's Knowing what I know now, I could... I could hit that trade 
and probably make a lot of money. Um, but that was, that was a failure, right? We talked about failure earlier. Yeah. And so what do I do? <laughs> I get back up and I start a farm. Um, no, in the, in the backyard, we lived in North Austin at the time. I was on an acre and a half. We had a garden. I was just always really interested in growing stuff and plants. Um, and we visited my family in Illinois, and we went to a pick-your-own-blueberry farm. He was on, I think, six acres out in the country, and I was just talking to the owner, shooting the breeze, and he did not ever have a problem moving his fruit. Uh, small town, Illinois. And I was like, oh, wow. That was where the moment of like, hey, this hobby and this light bulb of Austin is a large market. Because I'd been here at that time for 10 years, uh, 12, 13, anyway, some 13 years. And, and that was the light bulb moment for me of, hey, there are farms like this spread around the country. And you being from Pennsylvania, there are so many in Pennsylvania. I don't know. Did you ever go to any of the pick your own farms up there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially like around like like Halloween, yep. like, like pumpkin patches were a big thing. What were, what were the ones you went to? Um, uh, Finney's Pumpkin Farm. Okay, uh, that was like northwest Pennsylvania, like okay, like close to New York. Uh, that's one I remember. Northwest, northeast. Uh, yeah, northwest, like the very tip. Oh, got it, got a PA. it. PA. Uh, another one was um, uh, Troyer's uh, Farm. Okay. Uh, was a big one that was like a Union City, Waterford, Erie. Uh, that was a big one. You could pick strawberries there. Yeah. Okay. So that was that was the light bulb moment, and I came back, and I, that's when I started looking for land because I was like, if you want, I had I had one competitor, uh, which was Sweetberry Farm in Mar Marble Falls. They'd been doing strawberries. I'd been there, and they do a fall fest. And if you wanted to do peaches, you had to go to Fredericksburg. It was a two two and a half hour drive. And so if I ever started my own business and got away from trading, number one, it needed to be a business large enough that could replace my trading. Uh, and number two, I wanted it to be a business that I could monopolize and dominate in. Uh, I was not really interested in creating another me too business. I didn't want to do a, a pizza joint uh, or something like that. Um, and so I saw this, this market opportunity where my passion was, which was having really good fruit. And I saw that, hey, Austin can support this. And so we came back and we just started looking for land and just seeing what was out there, uh, what was on the market, who was a rational seller. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let me kind of back up again just a little bit before that. So I, I had a lot of success in trading. Uh, we did. I did spend several years, year and a half, uh, trying to do some variations on that, uh, where I learned a lot more coding and a lot uh, more data analytics, um, where myself and a few other people, ultimately we failed. We decided that it, we could not continue on in that journey. And so I had tasted failure and I tasted the bitterness of failure because I hadn't really ever known that in my life, right? You just kind of coasting through life. You go to college, you show up, uh, pay attention, you do a little bit of studying, you get good grades. It's, it's not rocket science. It's not hard. Right. Um, I started trading, and in a world where you've got a very high percentage of people who fail, I had success there. And I had married the woman of my dreams. And so I, all of these things were going overall pretty well for me and then boom i had tasted failure and that that pill was a bitter pill to swallow yeah um was it pride that got in the way no no i don't think it was i think um one of the lessons learned with with that as well as the farm is hey what's the quickest path towards profitability mm -hmm. what is the quickest path towards cash flow and those, those are really important things to think about when you're in a position where you have no income uh, and, and I'll, I'll touch it on that and that lesson learned here in a minute. And, and so after, uh, the failure there, before I started the farm, I still had an itch. You kind of get an itch as an entrepreneur. Hey, I want to do something. <laughs> yeah. I want to challenge myself. I want to push my limits, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and there's a question of how good can I be as John Meredith? What is, what, is, what is the optimal, to go back to your first person that you interviewed, what does the optimal John Meredith look like? Um, and so 
I had kicked it around. Uh, I'd met with a few people in the Austin tech space um, where I, I had some different ideas for tech companies to start. And I think one of the most challenging things, and you'll see a, a huge difference in the tech world versus um, the non-tech world. I'm trying to be nice for all the, the tech viewers out there, but I want to say the real world. Yeah. Uh, because the tech world is kind of this abstractness of code, and there are people, and you have you have physical interactions with people. But in trading, I was on such an isolated bubble um, that I hadn't experienced uh, and, and perhaps you have growing up in that blue collar community the the more blue collar aspects of our of austin and of america in general yeah um so anyway i was talking with these these tech people and after experiencing failure uh with the trading group um i thought okay do i want to dump all of my money into a tech startup uh, where at the end of the day, if I fail, I'm left with some code that nobody wants. And my answer was really no. Uh, I, I viewed that as fairly risky, which ironically, you know, somehow farming is less risky, um, where there's a million things outside of your control, but that's life, right? Uh, and so I decided not to pursue that that tech startup idea and instead... Uh, when that light, I just basically sat on my hands and waited for the next idea or whatever. I'm sure I had a million ideas at that time. Uh, but when I had a good idea, which was starting this farm, this this business that I could monopolize and dominate. So uh, we came back and I started looking for land, looking for rational sellers, because if I uh, failed at this business, which I failed before, uh, I wanted to be able to exit the business and still have some assets worth something. I wasn't going to go and overpay for land or anything like that. And um, we came back. We found some land up in Georgetown. Uh, we were also in talks down with some land in Bastrop to do blueberries down there. I was trying to, to do both. And being an entrepreneur, you're usually blinded with optimism. You think, you know, this can't – people have been farming for years. This can't be that hard. Um and you go into it with rose-colored glasses, much like you do if you're getting married, much like you do if you're having children. Like, hey, people have been having kids forever. How hard can this be? Well, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. really challenging to have kids. Um, and so we bought two pieces of property, actually. I bought the farm in Georgetown, the, the farm in Bastrop. We tried to do blueberries down there. We were trying to do peaches up in Georgetown. And um, my attention and my focus was really divided between the two properties much. And I was still trading at the time. I'd hired a manager from Colorado to come down and he uh, to, to run the farm. But it was such a big project that he wasn't, you know, he needed a lot of help. And he, he had people who were working for him, farm hands that were installing irrigation and we were doing the plantings and things like that. Uh, but one of the, the bigger challenges in any of these crops like this is from the day you plant to the day you start getting a commercial harvest is about three years. And so you have all of this capital outlay going out, 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 and you have nothing coming in. Right. And, and your cash flow really starts to hurt. And so I'm writing all these big checks and my, my bank account's getting less and less and less. And, and in trading, um, psychology is everything. Uh, the mechanics of trading is like 10%. Having a good idea, maybe 10%. It's actually your mental ability to be able to withstand your losers and not actually view it as money that makes you successful. Hmm. Um, and, and so um, my psychology in trading starts to wane. And I had never had a year where I'd been down. I'd made money every year I'd been trading until I just kept outlaying all of this capital. And my psychology just started getting worse and worse. Because I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do if I fail on this? Because now I've pumped all of this money in. And, and sure, we can recoup some of it by selling the land. But there's still a massive loss here, even if I just exited the business. And uh, that's when I made the decision to, uh, several decisions. And this is kind of in a, in a large overarching year time frame. Number one, um, we decided to stop farming the Bastrop land, uh, I needed to focus on, hey, w which piece of property is doing better? And the, the peach trees in Georgetown were doing much better. And so I'm reining back my focus and I'm focusing on that. Number two, 
I'm trying to hedge out my risk. Uh, because my background, uh, I understand risk. I like to think pretty well. Um, and um, if I have all of this capital going out each year and I, my crops don't produce, now what? And the farm manager from Colorado, his family was in the, we're going to use the word agritainment business, where um, the whole idea of a pumpkin patch and people coming on to do things other than just pick fruit was known. And so we, that's when we started like, okay, let's, let's do the pumpkin patch and we're going to start to build a few activities. And so we opened in 27, we, I bought the land in 2013. Uh, we ordered the trees. It takes a year because they have to be grown out in the nurseries. When you're talking the quantities, it's not like you can go to Home Depot and get thousands and thousands of trees. Right. Um, and, and so we planted the trees in 2015. I'm still just outlaying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in capital expenses and payroll and things like that. And I got zero coming in. And so finally, tw- the winter of 2016 is when we started building the activity side of the farm. We opened up in Easter time frame. And we had a whole bunch of people out there the first, the first few weeks because it was Easter and me not knowing anything about the industry, uh, your attendance plummets after Easter, uh, the, the spring season and the fall season are really the two more seasonal times that people want to be outside and enjoy a farm and enjoy what we're doing. And so we opened up and we had great success and then it died. And then I really had a, I'm thinking, okay, once we finally get to open, it's kind of like once you get to pushing a video out, you feel, uh, I don't want to say a sense that I've made it, but hey, this is my first video. Now the rest of this may be a little bit easier when in reality, the journey's just beginning. Yeah. And that was really, for me, the journey was just beginning in 2017 uh, because like any good business owner, you do more of what's working and less of what's not, right? And I could see that, hey, people really valued the agritainment side, and yes, they liked to pick fruit, but if you're actually looking at the numbers on the paper, the fruit picking was not nearly uh, as profitable as the margins on the, the agritainment side. Uh, and there's a lot of risk. Like we just had the most recent hailstorm. It wiped out the peaches for the year. Right. So a whole year of production gone in 30 seconds on things outside of my control, which Again, that's life. That's what COVID was for everybody, things outside of their control. Uh, how do you, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs on how to handle things that are outside of your control? Um, take it as it comes. That's all you can do, right? There are some people that are so wired to try to, try to uh, operate inside of this box. And when things are outside of their control, like I was saying, they have, they're riddled with anxiety. Um, in reality, uh, we, ad- we make policies and we address things. I'm not trying to solve every, every possible issue. I'm trying to solve my biggest issues. And when something crops up, then, it, then we're going to implement and craft a policy, or I'm going to try to, to, um, hedge that risk or that event to the best of my ability. I I was talking to a, um, like a C level executive a couple years back and he kind of, you know, sat me down, uh, and we had talked about like his priorities, Mm -hmm. you know, for the year. Uh, I I had earned that meeting with him. Uh, and you know, he kind of explained his role as like a CIO, like his role as a CIO he is overseeing an entire forest fire and he's just choosing based on the, on the data, like, like which areas in that forest need addressed Yep. immediately. Mm-hmm. But there's a forest fire Yep. going on. Yep. I think it was Elon Musk uh, who had talked about how as the CEO of a business or C-suite, you're a filter for the, for your worst problems. And effectively, one of my managers did a really good analogy of like, he sees something like this. He sees the edge of this phone, but me being the owner of the company, I'm seeing it from up here from a much higher view. And I've got a a different perspective. And so all of the employees of the company, they may see the problems with their particular areas, but I'm a filter for the company as a whole. 
And what are my priorities? And my priorities may not be the employee's priorities, which sometimes then creates some issues because they don't understand why I'm not addressing something. It's not that I'm not addressing because I don't want to. It's because I've got other priorities that are more pressing to fix. Right. Yeah. Um, so with, with the farm in 2017, uh, all I knew is I wanted to keep adding activities because that's what people liked. And it, it, how did you know that people liked the activities? Like what data points were you using to? So yeah, at the time we weren't doing surveys or KPIs or anything like that. It was just Facebook reviews. Like even Google, Google reviews weren't huge at that time. Right. Uh, and so our Facebook customers gave us those reviews and Facebook reviews have fallen off since then. Uh, as far as like, they're not part of the Facebook. I think sometimes they're not even part of a Facebook ecosystem. Um, and so that, that was kind of, hey, I know I've got a good product and now I need to expand upon it. Mm -hmm. And I know that I need to just dump some gasoline onto this fire. Uh, but at the same time, the, the agritainment or the amusement or the farming industry, take your pick, is an incredibly capital intensive business. It takes a lot of money to get into that and a lot of money to do anything. Like I'm getting ready to do tulips uh, for this next year. We've never done tulips before. I'm having to spend about $80,000 and we're planting 220,000 tulips. And I run a tremendous amount of risk because it's a 14 to 21 day bloom. If every day that you have 80 degree temperatures, you lose four days of bloom. And as you know, in Austin, because you've been here, we can be hitting 80s in February. Right. Right. And so I've got a two week, two week window, which could be less, could be 10 days. Maybe I get two weekends if I'm lucky out of it to recoup $80,000 and then make a profit on top of it. Um, and so it, it's fraught with, with risk uh, in that regard. I'm trying to grow the farm and add new things. Uh, and there's this just constant churn of capital. And uh, it, it wasn't really until 2019 we visited a farm in Omaha called Vallas. Uh, so in, in 28, well, let me back up. In 2018, uh, the farm had flooded for Fall Fest. We had a terrible year, rain every weekend in October where the farm makes its, the most amount of its money. And I had a line of credit that was due. I ended up having to sell my house in Austin. And my wife and myself and our three kids, we moved into a room that is smaller than your living room. And we lived there. I built a loft. So it was bunk beds and a loft for my, my third, my youngest kid. And we lived in that room for four years uh, as I was trying to write the financial ship uh, of my personal family finances as well as the farm finances. And, and so we talk about adversity and overcoming adversity. And we talk about being all in. Well, I'm all in on my business. Uh, you know, we sold basically everything we had and most of my money got dumped into the business uh, because I, I believe in my product and I believe in the trajectory of where I'm going with it. Uh, but 20, 2019, uh, we visited this farm called Vallas in Omaha, which is where I kind of got this light bulb, getting the second light bulb moment of, hey, really what I am is a farm-themed amusement park. People come here because they want to experience a farm without all of the, the work of it. And so that kind of uh, opened my eyes again to what I was. And, and when we came back, basically my goal ever since has been to take like the best aspects of the amusement park industry because I learned a lot about the amusement park. We joined IAPO, which is the amusement park industry trade group. Uh, they meet in Orlando every year. You know, it's a lot of people who like to have a lot of fun. And then I learned the best part of agriculture and I'm trying to merge them together, you know, to create something super unique here in Austin yeah. that you can't find anywhere else. When in reality you can, you go to Valleys. There are some in Pennsylvania where people are doing similar things, but the community is a very tight knit community. We're very open and sharing, which is why I'd ask you where you were going. Cause I'm actually getting ready to go visit some of the farms up there. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we're very open and, and willing to share amongst each other, uh, which has been immensely helpful. And everybody has gotten better because of it. The whole industry saw a huge bump with COVID because our types of venues were seen as a safe alternative to doing anything else because you're outside and you're away from people. 
Um, so since 2019, we've kind of been on this march of realizing this vision of farm themed amusement park and hey, what does that look like? What are the best practices? What are people that are doing things really well in the industry? What are they doing and how can we bring that into the farm? What does that look like for us to do it well here? And I am super excited about the future uh, of the business. I'm always excited about the future of the business, just naturally optimistic. We're doing a, a dinosaur themed fall fest and then we're bringing in animatronic dinosaurs and putting them inside the corn maze in November. Uh, we've got uh, really awesome shows coming this fall uh, as far as we, so in October we, we bring in subcontractors to, to do shows and performances. Uh, and so we've got uh, a lady who has exotic animals. We've got the falconeering show, Birds of Prey, uh, that'll swoop around and they do all kinds of tricks. We've got the fire dancers coming in. We do fireworks. I think that um, people will always pay for a quality experience, and it's a question of how do I improve the quality. So my, my, first, my first goal when I came back was we started taking out those peaches, and the first peach that I bulldozed, it hurt. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm admitting I'm wrong. Right. This is not working, but then there is met with this optimism for the future because I know where I want to go. I've got a vision for what I want to see. And so we take, we take out the peaches and we start to reorganize the farm and we start to build what you have seen as the entrance building, admissions, the bakery, the, the exit through the gift shop, because that is what you do in the industry. People are leaving. Well, here's some items to buy on your way out. And, and it was very intentional. These are impulse buys. And I know that plush toys for kids is um, uh, really popular. And so we put that on that little spinning carousel right there because kids are walking by right there and they're going to want that. Right. Uh, and, and just like I'm trying to take the best, ind best aspects of the amusement and the agriculture industry, now I'm also learning about retail. How do I take the best aspects from retail? And so I go around and I start picking people's brains on how in, in the retail space, hey, what does Target do? What does Walmart do? How do they measure inventory and velocity and things like that? Because I'm trying to take those aspects and, and, and apply them to my operation. Um, so we, we did that. And then, like you had talked about being being the filter for the problems my biggest problem was my food like if you look at our yelp reviews we get smoked who uses yelp anymore but that's besides the point but um we had terrible food for a long time but it was because i needed something that a high school kid could make something that i wouldn't have a lot of food waste in mm -hmm. um, and so once i finished with that and we had hit certain crowd size uh, I made the decision to invest in our food and beverage infrastructure. And that's when we built the big grill and the sweets and the pizza truck and the beer tap wall, uh, trying to accommodate the crowds that we were doing. But again, it's really, really hard in our industry because you have peak season, right? And you, in a theme park world, you never design for 100% capacity. You design for about 90% capacity. Because if you're doing 100, you're over capacity most of the time. Right. Um, and, and so uh, I fixed the food in the sense of, hey, we can do quite a bit of people on any given day. A and we have the throughput and the we're still working on some of the quality control issues. Uh, so there's still some there's always right. No matter what you do, there's always room for improvement. Yeah. Uh, but really, my attention and my focus is getting ready to turn back towards the, the customer experience and the activities that you experience. So when you came out, for example, I assume you did the apple cannons. Yes. Uh, and which is an adult yeah. favorite thing. Uh -huh. uh, that, that whole area of the farm, I am processing in my head. And I've started, like, I buy clay, and I'm trying to make some molds and, and planning it out on, hey, what does this look like? Uh, I'm building... I'm going to call it Old Town. Uh, it's going to be basically a farm-themed 1940s town with a little town roundabout in the center. And we've got those old farm trucks that are going to be there. There's going to be games on them. And I, I'm taking these ideas both from the amusement as well as the agriculture industry of how do we theme this really well so that customers have a really unique experience. Uh, and, and the best that I can describe it, have you been to Schlitterbahn? Yeah. So Schlitterbahn, best water park in the world, like 25 years in a row. 
I've been here for 21 years and last year was the first year I ever went. I'd been down, floated the river, et cetera. But I was blown away by how much character existed in Schlitterbahn. And when I say character, I mean, have you been to Kalahari? No. Uh, so Kalahari Indoor Water Park, they run a great operation without a doubt. It's a hotel uh, and they have a um, arcade and uh, indoor play area and then they've got the water park. But all of Kalahari's slides, I can go buy. As easy as I can buy an iPhone or a DLR camera, mm -hmm. uh, I can go buy those slides and I can create my water park. Kalahari, you can tell, was built over time. And you can start to see that character that the, that the family that had it, they eventually sold uh, their own mount by Cedar, Cedar Fair. Uh, it's a big amusement park company. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see that character. And that's really, for the locals, if I could say what I am, I would say I'm trying to become the Schlitterbahn of farms in the sense of uh, a regional amusement park that is themed, uh, in my case, like a farm. They are themed like a, a water park, but there's there's character there. John, what's your favorite thing to do in Austin? <sighs> Gosh, off the cuff, I say work, but that's just because I own my own business. And so I like what I do. I, I like, I mean, there are days, right? Everybody has has bad days and you don't like what you do. Um, but if, if I was a newcomer to Austin, I mean... Your channel is the best best spot to see all of the great options that exist uh, here in Austin. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I really do. Um, what has been your favorite experience here in the Austin area other than your business? I, th I think my, my favorite aspect or my favorite experience to do in the Austin area, uh, definitely Schlitterbahn up there, especially in the summertime. It's hot sucks to be outside yeah and i think that's a place that both adults and kids can have a really really good time so whether you're going by yourself or you're or with your friends or whether you're going with your kids it is a it is a great experience and i think one not to be missed well what lessons in your early adulthood do you still implement today um people really matter like you're, you're not an island. You can't do, you, for example, can't do this channel alone. Like, yes, in the beginning, you're going to do this alone. And I think that that's where you see some of the other content creators is they're trying to leverage other people. That's why they outsource certain things like post-production um, because they literally don't have enough time in their day. Uh, but beyond that, it's not just leveraging people and viewing them as assets. These, these are real people. They work for you. And how can you come alongside them? And like I had said, my passion is to take things from A to B. Mm -hmm. My passion was never to start a farm. The farm is an expression of my passion to take something from A to B. And so how do, how do I take this individual or this person from their current thinking and their current way of life to, to this and, and watch them grow? I get a lot of joy and I get a lot of value uh, knowing that I have a purpose in in seeing personal growth in people's lives, that's, that's awesome. And and so, what what events do you have uh, coming up that you're most excited about? With the farm, with the farm, um, Fall Fest. I'm 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 always excited for Fall Fest to start, and I'm always excited for Fall Fest to end because it is hell. Uh, yeah, I mean, two years ago, 128 days, 120 days without a day off. Uh, last year, I think I did 60, which was a market improvement. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, and these are these are long freaking days. It is challenge. Uh, that's that's when the farm does majority of our revenue, and so I'm there all the time. Uh, I'm really excited about because I think it's going to be the best fall fest we've ever had. Uh, I think it's going to be the most beautiful, but in general, I'm excited about the future of the farm. We, we've started, uh, again, going back to best practices, um, what you see in the amusement world is, uh, theming. And, and when you visited the farm, uh, sure, it felt like a farm because you were at a farm because yeah, we were growing strawberries and we're growing peaches and we're growing Christmas trees and you see chickens running around and you have horses and goats and sheep. 
you get that farm feel. But beyond that, we're getting into foam props uh, and eventually more animatronics uh, where uh, it gives you a higher quality experience. And you get these photo ops that you can't find anywhere else. Those Apple cannons that you really enjoyed, a farm up in Michigan produces those. You can find those at half the farms around the country. You can't find a custom prop that we develop ourselves anywhere. And so I'm really excited about uh, the theming and the feel that uh, the, the user is going to get when they, when they actually enter the property. And this is a three-year project that we're, we're going on with that. So That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and John, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, what's one thing you'd like to leave? It could be anything outside of business that you'd like to leave the audience with today. Is my audience newcomers or is my audience business people? Newcomers. Um, y- your experience that, that you have here, uh, to Jake's point, as far as if you're feeling isolated and feeling, hey, what, what do I expect? Um, it's not an Austin, Texas thing, and you're not alone in that feeling of isolation. Um, no matter where you go, no matter... Um, yes, you can move back to your home where you're from and you have this natural built-in community, but, um, use this time to get outside your comfort zone, to meet interesting people, um, and and really try to mature and grow as a person, try to push your limits. 